I also ask that you would bow with me as we pray and ask God to help us. For our blessed Redeemer, yes, together we have sung and we great privilege that is ours, those of us who are saved, that we have been drawn to you, Father, your great work. We have been added to your church, Lord Jesus, your own sovereign and mysterious work. And long and ask of you even that you would continue that work of building your church, saving sinners, even strengthening your very body, taking the word that you have given as a means toward that end, even this morning. Bless your truth to our hearts, we pray. Give us light and Father, would you not teach us? Would you not feed our souls? Would you not give us wisdom and counsel from your holy scriptures? Would you not lead us in your way? We ask these things for your sake, for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who have gone through the process, that process of going to an optometrist, having the various tests done upon your eyes, being told then by that optometrist at the end of that appointment that you really do prescription glasses. Your eyes were tested. You've If you like, failed the test in one sense or another sense, you've passed the test and with relief you are now going to get some assistance. If you have been through that process, and I know a number of you have, you have come out the other side and relate to the experience that I went through and perhaps you went through that first time those glasses, those new glasses were put on. That moment that you looked through those spectacles that were designed for your eyes and their needs, you saw things in a way that you could see them. I vividly remember looking up to the clock and thinking, I can see the second hand ticking. I vividly remember looking at the back of my hand and I could see the hand, the hairs on the, on the, on the back of my, my hand. Of course, I hadn't realised and maybe you were like this as well, low deterioration, my sight had become blurry. And I said, cheekily perhaps last week, that maybe some of you need to go back to the optometrist because maybe it's time that you could realise that your eyes have slowly deteriorated and there is a blurriness. Optometrists, we are in the midst of a series of sermons on the aspects of the church. And friends, what I've just described, as I hinted at last week, I believe it's, spiritually speaking, what we all need. We all need to look at this subject of the Christian church through the lens of Scripture. Without understanding the church through the Bible, our vision will be fuzzy. Now, perhaps some of you as Christians are right now like I was before looking through my literal glasses. Perhaps it is that you have never closely looked at the doctrine of the in the Bible and and what you have believed really uh, um, about the church is probably what you've picked up over the years by being in church. Perhaps you've never been anywhere in terms of your Christianity where you have you've been taught about the doctrine of the church. For others of you, I know this is the case because some of you have even told me that you you have been to so many churches in the past that you sort of even struggle to remember all those churches. And that perhaps, understandably, has tended to create fuzziness and and the, the Christian church of what it is to be. Well, if that has been describing you. I I trust that this series that we're considering will will bring much clarity to your thinking about the Christian church. That God might give you clear sight of his church, not just what you thought before, it's not just what your parents thought or what you have picked up, but it's what God actually says himself about his church. Yet there are others of us here, we have studied these truths before. And perhaps it is also the case that 
can so easily occur even for us as well when it comes to our thinking on the doctrine of the church, especially living in the the days that we are living where there are so many different ideas that are floating around about the church. And so, I believe we all need of the church afresh through the lens of Scripture with, if you like, our Bible glasses on. Last week we began to do that, for those of you who were here, remember, and we saw what the church really is like when viewed from God. It is God's glorious church. That's God's view. And God's view is always right. I think one of the chief errors in studying of this subject is that most begin with and not with God. Let me test you. Those of you who were here last week, when, when you heard me announce that we're going to have a series, a brief series of sermons about the church, did you begin to think immediately about church structure, personalities, uh, maybe your previous church experience? Was your starting point man rather than God? Now, it is understandable that you might default to that pattern because in a way, in, in a way that is how we have been conditioned to think I'm speaking about. That term that we mentioned last week that has been bandied around a lot in recent years, how we do church. That is an illustration that when the modern church talks about the church, their default starting point is what church The problem with that is that is not the starting point of the Bible. And so, to view the church from from, from a right perspective, uh, we'll end up with, I think, somewhat of a different conclusion rather than looking at it from down here at man's point. It'll end up being fuzzy and a blurry view. So, ultimately, the Christian church is not about what we do, but it's about what Christ has done It's about what Christ is doing and it's about what Christ will continue to do. So many errors in the Christian life and in the church thinking. We must be Christocentric, Christ-centred, even when it comes to our understanding in the Scriptures of the church. So before we come to the issues that relate to church leadership, which if you like is one of the primary reasons... Before we come to all of those things, we're considering today Christ and the church. And this is a broad theme. There are many things to to touch on here in the scriptures. I want to just highlight three today and and they will be these. They all start with the letter P just to try and be helpful for you. Firstly, Christ is proprietor. Secondly, Christ is preserver. And thirdly, Christ is provider. Firstly then, Christ is proprietor. Now, maybe some of the young ones think, what, what's that word, proprietor? Now, someone who owns a business is called a proprietor. So, for instance, we just think of our own little company here, our own little group. There are several men in our church who, who have their own small business. So, as we think of them as an illustration of what a proprietor is, we could say that, that, that Lance is proprietor of Todd's Auto Trim and Upholstery. We think of, of Andrew Gibbs. He is proprietor of Gibbs Hurley Chartered Accountants. Mark is proprietor of, of, of Ipswich Trophy Centre and so on. Okay? Jesus Christ is proprietor the church and his business is building. Or put it in a different way, Christ is owner, builder of his church. Turn with me in your Bibles back to, if you're not there already, Matthew 16 and look with me, our, our focus is not going to be the entire paragraph but we're homing in on verse where Jesus says as he's interacting with the disciples and in particular Peter's answer, he says in verse 18, I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
question in this verse is who or, or what is Jesus referring to when he says this rock? Now all of that discussion that often is had on that verse and on that point is very important. And we would strongly assert that Jesus is, a not, is not announcing Peter as Pope. But friends, such discussions in this verse about that issue tend to overshadow the other things that Jesus says in this verse. Very important things that Jesus says in the midst of speaking about this rock and Peter and so on. Fundamental that Jesus says here in the midst of that verse where he says, and on this rock I will build my church. We ask the question to those words of Jesus, Whose church is it? And we know the answer. It's not Peter's church. Jesus tells us, I will build my church. I own the church. I possess the church. It's mine, Jesus says. This is my church. Now, as basic and as simple as this is, it is so very easily forgotten in the life of the Christian church. And so when people start asserting and, and speaking like, well, we, we think this is a, a, what should happen in our church, very quickly we can lose our way. The fundamental truth of the doctrine of the church can be lost, can be at least blurred. Ultimately, this is not our church. Now, in saying that, I, I'm not necessarily at all saying that it's wrong in casual conversation to refer to this as my church, church. That's not the point I'm making. But I trust you can see the subtlety that can come in in our language. And so, we must have this thing clear in our sights, in our understanding. This is Christ's church. It's therefore not up to us to determine what should happen to Christ. Why? Because it's his church. He owns it, as we saw last week from Acts 20. He purchased it with his own blood. He bought it. He's paid the price for it. It's his. Turn with me in your Bible, Timothy chapter 3, because here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, I think Paul picks up something on this very thread of thought. In the midst of his instructions to Timothy... There, who was labouring in the church at Ephesus, and after already addressing a number of things that ought to be, has, Paul makes this point in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. We'll read from verse 14. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so Paul is saying, Timothy, understand that there in Ephesus, that is not your church. I'm writing to you as one who appointed by Christ. I am one of his apostles and I write what wants to happen in his church. And so what's he said back in chapter 2? Specifically he says, I want to make sure you understand that Christ wants the men in the church to lead when it comes to praying together. Men ought to lead in prayer, he says. He goes on to say in relation to their attire when they come together. He then speaks about the role of women in terms of authority and teaching in the gathering of God's people. He then moves in chapter 3 to talk about who he wants to be leaders in the church. He wants elders, he wants deacons to be the leaders in the church. But ultimately he wants those elders to be the oversight of the church and he tells us what those men are to look like, if you will. What they are to be as men in terms of their life, in terms of their family. So he's been very specific. This is not your church, Timothy. Ephesus, all of that, is God's church. It's not the members' church. It's not the deacons' church. It's not the elders' church. And Timothy, in a specially appointed position as an apostolic delegate, it is not your church either. 
that this meant. Timothy, not even Timothy, had the authority or the liberty to come up with his own ideas of what should happen in the church. And so if there was any temptation, hey, you know, Ephesus is a modern city. It's one of the major minor. And therefore we need to come up with novel ways on how to do church. If there was any thinking, hey, we're Ephesus. I mean, we're not Berea, a backwater town of nowhere. We're Ephesus. We need to be on the cutting edge. We need to be really in traction and going to attract the rising generation in this city. Any such thinking needed to be put out of their minds. Friends, you and I have as as much right to do that as we do tomorrow to walk into Andrew Gibbs' office and to tell him how to manage and how to improve his business. He's the owner. He's the proprietor. It's up to him to determine what happens in that situation. And and we must consult the owner of the church to know what he wants when it comes to his church. So, Christian brothers and sisters, we need to keep this truth at the fore of our minds. Now, it's important that we should have that when a church starts. And I believe we did. Be part of the thinking of a a new church as it was for us some, some decade ago. But this must remain central in our thinking. BBC is Christ's church and we must consult him as to how he wants things to be structured in his church. How he wants us to live together as a local congregation, who he wants to lead in this church and how they are to lead and what is to be their function. I'm not sure whether you can see this, but this is such a far, far cry from the recent trendy expression. Let's talk about how we... Friends, Christ is owner. But back in Matthew 16, if we go back there, Jesus also tells us he's not only owner, he's builder. Let's just go back to those verses and if you like here, the Lord Jesus is speaking to us this morning through us. He says, I will build my church. In the first century, The church only grew beyond its 120 who were assembled together in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. It only grew from thousands and thousands in the weeks and months that flowed after those events because of one reason in the end. Christ was building. That's what was happening. Christ was building. He was active in those days as owner, builder. He was doing what he promised to do in Matthew 16, 18. He was fulfilling his very word. And so what do we read in Acts 2 right at the end of that chapter? Do you remember what Luke says in a summary? He says in Acts 2, 47, the Lord added to the church... Jesus was keeping his promise of what he said to the disciples out here on this road towards Caesar uh, Caesar, uh, Philippi. Jesus was saving sinners. Jesus was adding those sinners to his church. Acts 2.47 says, the church, those who were being saved. Now to pursue church growth may seem very appealing to pursue church growth may indeed seem harmless and even the right course of action. But it can so very quick sight of who is the one who must build the church. Friends, this must be our starting point and this must be our continual conviction. Christ is the owner and builder of his church. If we see fresh growth fresh Christians from church to church but sin is saved added to the local church that's what Christ does 
And unless he does it, no matter how novel the idea is or how fanciful or innovative or cutting edge is the technology used or whatever Christ builds, it'll never happen. Not true, fresh growth. You turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, please. Psalm 127, because I believe here we have an important balancing word. Psalm 100, verse 1. As soon as you see the verse, you'll, you'll know why we've turned here. Maybe. If not, stay tuned. 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house. Okay, he's a builder. Same God, he hasn't changed. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labour in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Yes, the Lord must build the house. Word here, can you see it? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labour. They're working hard. They labour in vain who build it. What's that saying to us? We must labour in the building of God's house. And so, that God expects that we will all be committed and labouring in building work in relation to his house. That that we will not be distant, but in differing ways. Everyone will be getting their their hands dirty. (laughs) Uh, They'll be be work diligently, labouring together for the expansion of God's kingdom. Unashamedly, signing up to work in Christ's construction company and getting perhaps literally grubby out there, mowing the chili, getting our hands dirty or or, or messy, cleaning the toilets. It's practical. Out there maybe, knocking on doors, handing out tracts, perhaps even involved in a potential nursing home ministry caring for for old folk who, who have souls or at a local market, whatever it is, labouring together in construction. When we read our New Testaments, there is no such creature as a Christian who stays disconnected from the local church. And I believe you'll look in vain. Christians who isolate themselves from God's people especially I'm speaking about when there is a church available, are frankly acting unbiblically and unwisely. I say, verse 1 says, the man who isolates himself rages against all wise judgment. Now, I want to address the young people and say, why would you talk about particularly the young people, because I want the young people to have a sense of desire and delight and commitment to Berkeley. That's what I would desire you to be into the future. Fully dedicated to Christ's church. But young people beware, because Satan, I think it's only a matter of time, that he will come to you in the coming years. He will. He will, uh, he will be tempting you tempting you to move away from a healthy church just so that you can get that perfect job, just so that you can climb the career ladder. Young people don't listen to him. He knows, away from a faithful church, that he actually has them on the road to apostasy or destruction. You think you're being overdramatic, don't you? That's what you think, some of you? Well, I could share with you privately situations of people who have deliberately made these choices, men who saw career opportunities, they could not resist the temptation and today they are divorced, their children are in a mess because they moved away from what spiritually they needed. Even Psalm 127, the Lord will be committed and that we will be labouring in building work. Young people, the Lord even wants you 
to embrace this very perspective and have the delight to give yourself to building, getting your hands, constructing together under the Lord. Now let's come back to the balance, back to this verse. Our hard work must always be with the recognition that the Lord is the owner builder. And unless our hard work, our grubby hands, our blister, our efforts, our being spent for him, unless he builds, it will all be in vain. We are completely dependent upon him for working. But that doesn't mean we sit back and just let him do all the work. Psalm 112, balance. And friends, the fact that we are completely depend upon him to be the ultimate builder, that simple basic point is in the end why we as a church must pray together. Because Christ is the owner, Christ is the builder of the construction. Remember what Isaiah says, Isaiah so positively, with clarity, He says, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Remember him saying that? We know God doesn't have a literal hand, but he's communicating the fact that God has power. He He has all the power necessary to reach down to earth and to save sinners and to add them to his church. Well, I say it reverently, what must we do in prayer as a people we must in sleeve of the arm of God that he might even be pleased to reach down that powerful hand and save in our day. And whatever building work has happened, friends, in this church over the last decade, let's get it clear. Christ, the owner builder, has been a work among us and therefore he is the one who is to get all the praise. Christ is proprietor. Come with me back to Matthew 16. Secondly, Christ is preserver. We're inching our way through this verse slowly. Jesus says, I will build my church and the the gates of Hades shall not prevail against her or against it. It's a promise. God's just promising to build his church. Now what's he promising? As long as his church is in this world to the end of time, Jesus will be actively working to ensure that his church will be preserved. This is a wonderful, wonderful promise. What's this? Why gates? Well, in the Bible, the, the gates represents authority and power. And so in the Jewish mind, the gates is what is perhaps to us what we may call city hall or, or parliament. The important gates. Well, men with authority in that society sat at the city gates. Men who had power and influence in that city sat at those gates. And so the gates of Hades then symbolises the organised power of death and Satan. He's saying that all the crafty subtlety, all the devilish schemes, Satan's power, all of that will be brought to bear on the church. The devil and all of those he's got at his aid, all of his demons, will ever be seeking to divide, to destroy Christ from the earth. That's their intent. Yet, despite all such devilish attempts, Jesus promises that ultimately they will never succeed. Now, there may be occasional victories. This is not a guarantee that every local church will continue. Aspect of this promise, I believe that we can apply and plead when it comes to the local church as a visible manifestation of the universal church. Why is it that Jesus promises that ultimately those attacks will never succeed? For the simple reason Christ himself has committed him to serving his church. Look at the verse at the end and see Jesus' clarity. He says, The gates of Hades 
shall not prevail. They shall not be victorious against the church or over the church. Well, it means today in this church and all over the world, Jesus is intimately involved in preserving his church. He's not just up there on a throne disconnected from what's happening in his church. He will not see his work spoiled by sin. And as Christians, we, must, we, ask, we actually must be his partners in this. That we too will not see Satan's work spoiling Christ's building work. And that means we will not be gullible instruments in Satan's hands. Using the language, we will not, ought not to be ignorant of Satan's tactics. I've often said this. It's, it's a great way to achieve many uh, wonderful victories or prevent attacks in warfare. It's why they have undercover spies. knows what the other side is planning to do. And if he can let that be known, he spoils those plans, then that attempt is largely neutered. That's what God expects of us, to know Satan's tactics. Not to be ignorant of what he will seek to do. Even And so I hope you can see these words of Jesus are not just about, oh, well, this is what he spoke, some dusty road in Palestine 2,000 years ago. It's so distant from us today. It's an irrelevant promise. Why are we even talking about it? No, friends, this is describing the life of the church. And by putting our scripture glasses on and looking at the Christian church through this lens of scripture, I believe it helps us to see what happens in churches sometimes. I remember some years ago, it wasn't here, it was elsewhere, a young Christian who had recently come into church membership and there was some outbursts of carnality really in his first members meeting. Things that should never have been said in that meeting were said. Things that were dishonouring to the Lord were said. They should not have been, they should not, that should not have happened. Now the form of church government in that congregation I think only helped to foster that sort of thing. That poor man found it hard to accept. He, he, he seemed, in, in, as a young Christian, he seemed to have the attitude that the churches are always to be, always to be perfect places. Now, on one level, he was right, wasn't he? On one level, he was right, dear man. We are to be those who are peacemakers, not peace breakers. So, on one level, he was right. But on another level, he hadn't yet learned that Satan is active in Christ's church. I didn't understand all that I understand now back then. I wish I had the scripture glasses I could have put on his nose and helped him to see. It would have helped him. Satan will do all he can to destroy Christ's church, his immune friends, including us here. Now, let's think about this. This is real life stuff. This is not just theory. This is real life stuff. When Jesus Christ saves sinners, as he has been doing among us, in to learn from the scriptures that Christ commands his disciples to be baptised, to be plunged under the water, to publicly and graphically demonstrate what he has already done in grace in baptising them in the Spirit. When young disciples come to see that, we ought not be so be hot on their heels trying to persuade them they need not bother, trying to persuade them they've misunderstood this, trying to persuade them it doesn't really matter. Now when that happens, looking with these scripture glasses, friends, can you see what's happening? Satan, he's trying his best to overturn it and destroy it. Satan will also come to profess Christians and I think he inflames in their minds, not in every case, but in some cases, making bigger in their thinking than reality all those believers back from committing to becoming members in the local church. Satan wants them to delay. 
He doesn't want them under the spiritual oversight of local shepherds because he knows that's what they need. Christians to put their career before Christ's kingdom. He's like a savage wolf. He wants to scatter the sheep. He wants to get individual sheep away from the flock. He wants them to stay at a distance from the church, to, 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 to stay away. Why? Because he wants to devour them. He roars, Peter says. He roars like a roaring lion. Satan knows how to put fear into some. Fear to get involved. Fear of being hurt again. And so he encourages them to stay at a distance and even to stay away from the church altogether. He is sneaky. Animal programs perhaps, we've watched the lions as they've been cameraed. They sneak. They come in the grass. Yes, they eventually prounce and they chase. And they get one aside so they can attack it. But in the first place they sneak. Yes, he roars and he scares, but he's sneaky. He's a sneaky enemy. And he will tempt Christians with their thinking. Go on, apply for that that job. It'll be a good career move for you. I mean, it'll be God's will, won't it, if you see the door open. Have they sought the Scriptures? Have they sought godly counsel from older, wiser, seasoned saints on that important decision? Oh, he's sneaky. He's out to attack the individual Christian and friends as we see the set on attacking Christ's church, even us. Satan wants to weaken churches. He's out to distract us. He's out to disturb us. He's out to divide us. He's out to scatter us. That's what he wants. He wants this church in two years' time to be made up of half a dozen. We are not ignorant of his devices, friends. It will happen. It happens in good churches. It happens. We see in Matthew 16, Jesus said, Satan would be doing all he can to undermine But friends, I I want to urge you at this point to step back and, and, and put our scripture spectacles on. Interpret through the lens of this very passage, yes, what sometimes happens in local churches, but see this other very tremendously encouraging truth that's there. But what's his promise? His promise is that the gates of hell shall not be victorious. Now we might look out across the contemporary church scene and we might scratch our head and wonder what's going on. Modern trends going to take the church. The rise of false teaching. The cancerous spread of charismatic doctrine which eventually leads for the Bible to be put aside. We might see the decline of biblical standards in the church. We may see world We see that the church has largely turned into an entertainment uh, centre with breaks for serving coffee and running social programs. We might see all these things and we could be tempted to begin to think that the world has almost smothered the church. We might be tempted to think if this continued to what the church was like only 20 years ago, then the next generation there will be no church. Friends, that is not true. That is not true true. That's what Satan wants us to think and to discourage us. That is not true. Now I do believe it is true that most other childish ideas that are floating around they will leave the church in a much weaker state than it was previously and those of you in the older generation you've seen this, you know. But this remains true friends. Christ is preserver of his For 2,000 years he's been doing this. Now's not the time to press the panic button. 
For 2,000 years, Jesus has been keeping his promise. He's doing it today in our generation and he will continue to be intimately involved in keeping his church to the very end. The Apostle Paul, toward the end of his life, expressed the fact that he had a deep burden for all the churches. But in the end, it's not our church. It's Christ's church. He's the owner. He's the builder and he's the preserver. I want us to think about something found in Ephesians chapter 4 that Christ is provider. Ephesians chapter 4. But to each one of us Grace was giving, given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who first descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now having recently been in this passage, we're not going to spend much time here, but let me just remind you that what Paul is doing when he writes and describes this, this thing here is, is it was a... They understood exactly what this is. This was based upon a common scene in the Roman world in first century. And so that scene was something like if a Roman general was out there and he was successful in battle with his soldiers. A great parade was arranged for their return into the city. And as they come through the city were the captives, the prisoners if you like, those who were defeated and they were carrying, as it were, coming as captives or prisoners. Out front is the general. He's triumphantly leading the captive. What then would happen is that the general would sit up on an elevated seat and on that, in that ascended position he would give out plunder that had been seized in that battle. And there in his ascended position, what would he be doing? He would be giving gifts out to men, to people there before him. That's the language. And what's Paul's point? Paul's point is not a lesson for us in Roman ways, in soldiers. Paul's point is about Christ. That Jesus Christ is our triumphant general. That he descended even to the very lowest parts, even to death himself. He was humble, even death on the cross. And yet there he achieved a great Calvary. On the third day, he demonstrated that victory by rising from the dead. But then what did our general do? He ascended on high. He returned to his sending city. And there in his, his ascended, exalted position at the... What's he doing? What's he doing? He's giving gifts to his church. Verse 11. He himself, our general, Jesus, gave some, literally is, he himself gave apostles... He gave prophets, pastors and teachers. There is Jesus Christ, intimately, practically involved in his churches below on earth by giving gifts to his church. Why? Christ giving the gift in particular as we look at that list of verse 11 why is in the, in the end we can be absolutely certain he is giving gifts of pastor teachers today, why? We keep reading verse 12 for, here's the reason the equipping of the saints for the work of the fine of the body of Christ to all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect or mature man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning plotting. The ascended Christ. 
our General Jesus, actively involved in providing for his church, specifically mentioned in this passage, Pastor Teachers. We'll look more closely in the coming weeks at the role of local pastors or shepherds in the church. But here now we just want to highlight the point of not starting with man but starting with him. We see Christ as provider. Christ as provider in our generation is giving gifts, calls to shepherd and teach local flock. Now, I trust you can see the relevance of this for our life together. I hope it's obvious. If we are to see a healthy, functioning eldership so that God cared for here, or if men are to be sent out as labourers into the field which is white under harvest, then we must recognise that such men are not man-made they are not Bible college produced, friends. Given. And a man is not an elder because the members voted to make him one. That's wrong thinking. The members are to simply recognise that Christ to his church. This speaks directly to us as a congregation. This is right where we are at, brethren. And so we need to continue to plead with Christ the provider, praying that our great general in heaven might be pleased in his exalted to this congregation. And I believe when he does, it will be evident to all. Firstly, the life of such man will, 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 show, will be shown to be a gift of Christ. It will be able to be measured against the scripture standard of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. And secondly, his capacity to teach and preach will be a church. Christ's gifts of pastor teachers, they are equipped and called to handle the word of God as they shepherd the flock. That's why pastor and teachers are put together at the end there. It may but in the end it will be a task that those men actually love to do because Christ is giving them for that purpose. In love, Christ is providing for the real needs of his people, his sheep. When viewing these things of appointment of church officers in particular, elders or pastors in the church, when when viewing these things through scripture spectacles, how this brings clarity? Seeing the church through the lens of this scripture, you know what it's going to do? It will deliver that thinking, biblically thinking politics. That's what it will do. So it won't be about that man manoeuvring himself amongst God's people to try and win their favour and win their vote. And it will deliver that thinking of a party spirit or wanting that man, because he's my friend, to be my representative for influence. They are things that happen in churches. No, 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 no. With scripture glasses, we are to see these men as Christ's gift to the church. He's the giver. He's the provider. And so these truths surely will make it clear that and it will help even remove that idea that others sometimes have that when someone's put into the position of an elder that's some sort of promotion. That's man-centered thinking. No, they're gifts from Christ. It's not about then. Can you see how we do church. It's not about how we move the deck chairs around with some fashionable new ways or zinging new title. Now in the end it's not about man. Christ is doing it is church. What then ought to be our response to this truth friends? Oh I I hope again it's obvious. We, we, We must plead with our Lord to give us such gifts even here. I want to borrow the words of someone else, Arnold Dallymore in his introduction, first volume of Whitfield's biography. 
Uh, this is, uh, I think, a wonderful summary of what we should pray for. What he says he wants, we should want, I think. We want Christ to give us mighty men in the Scriptures by a sense of the greatness, majesty and holiness of God whose minds and hearts are aglow with the great truths of the doctrines of grace. Men who have learned what it is to die to self and personal ambitions. Men who supreme collades but to win the Master's approval. These are the men who will preach with broken hearts and tear-filled eyes and upon whose ministries God will grant an extraordinary effusion of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord Jesus, such gifts to this church. And brethren, if Christ is about to do Ephesians 4.11, we must not praise the man. We must adore the provider. I trust you can see the place for us to start in dealing with biblical church government It's not with men, but it's with Christ. Because Christ is the proprietor, he is the owner builder. Christ is preserver. And may this Christ be praised.